teachers across Alberta. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to say, <coughs> oh, thank you. That was awesome. It's every, you know what? Fort McMurray is just the best. No, they really are. Thanks, Nancy. You're awesome. I'd like to just say, I'd like to say uh, yeah, for yesterday, I apologize for not being here yesterday, but it was uh, because I was at our D.A.R.E. conference. We have so many things going on this weekend. And uh, what I came to realize is over in Barnett House last night, we have a large number of dedicated Albertans that are dealing on other issues. And what's the best way to talk about the issues and share views and gain understanding from others is to actually get in the same room and sit down and talk. And that's what we were trying to pull together here today. And I'd like to thank our guests for coming today to share their views and really help inform us in terms of the direction that, that you believe we should be going and help make our opportunities for informed decisions more comfortable. And when I look at it, uh, I had a chance to, uh, to talk to the minister and say that we, we've got this event coming up and we want to talk about education. Um, unfortunately, with, with the decline from the party to be here, it makes it very difficult to gain a better understanding of where they're coming from in terms of education and educational issues. But that said, I've always followed the moniker that says, you don't dwell on who's not here as much as you dwell on who is here. And my belief is that if you're going to take the time to publicly talk about the issues, that demands the respect of Albertans. And make no mistake about it, we're entering into a time where Alberta's voices need to be heard. And they need to be heard in many different areas of the province. They need to be heard on all issues, not singular issues. Last night we heard a fair bit about the financial state of the province and how we don't need to fear the unknown quite as much as we're being led to believe. And in fact, the unknown is exactly what it is. The information that's being put out isn't necessarily the only point of view that's there. But you are here to listen and to gain understanding, and to make your own conclusions. And that's the value of the informed voice. That's the value of the educated voice. I spent time at our D.A.R.E. conference yesterday and talking about diversity, talking about human rights. I opened with the idea or the concept that one in ten Alberta children live in poverty. And frankly, that is unacceptable, and that is an issue that needs to be addressed. <laughs> the education sector touches so many lives in different ways. It talks about the present. Many of us here represent the past. <laughs> and as we move forward, Every day we go into our classes, we get a glimpse of the future. We influence the future. And each day we go in and we see children where we need to instill hope in the future. Well, I'll suggest to you as we get started today that we need to instill hope in the adults in this province and try to encourage every Albertan to find their voice. This concept of a broken democratic system, I don't necessarily believe. I think we're dormant. We don't have a voice, or we don't have a voice that will make a difference. I will suggest that we've got proof through the Bill 10 process that Alberta voices do make a difference. We just need to stand up and be heard. You represent the foundation of that. Leadership within the Alberta Teachers Association that are here to make an informed decision and to hear from the parties 
that want to share their views. I'm going to encourage you to ask the hard questions, to listen to the answers and dissect them, and to share what you've heard with your colleagues as we take the messages forward. I'd like to congratulate you and thank you for taking up your valuable time for being here today. I'd like to thank you for using your valuable time and being here today. Each time you've appeared, and I've said this to you, Darren, during summer conference, you earn the respect of Alberta teachers. And in the political realm, earning is a word that we very rarely seem to be using. It's about earning the respect of hardworking Albertans so that they can say, we want you to represent us. So thank you very much for being here. And I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say and dissecting it myself. We have a, a stellar guest this morning who's going to take care of us all and lead us through. Ms. Martin, I'd like to say thank you for being here. Look forward to your guidance as you uh, take us through the forum. And I'd like to say welcome. And I'm going to pass the podium on to you. Good morning. I'm not sure whether it's being a broadcaster or a mother that uh, gives me the skills to moderate panels. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to it and believe it or not, I think in my career it's one of the most challenging and daunting things that you can ask a news person, a television person to do. So it's fun to be here and uh, I echo those sentiments. It's wonderful to see debate happening and people participating and uh, giving Albertans options. Um, my name is Jennifer Martin. I am currently the manager of community programming or Shaw TV. With Shaw, uh, I manage 14 stations in northern Alberta, Saskatchewan and central BC. And I've been there for about a year and it's our pleasure to be bringing this morning that will be uh, a television show produced by the ATA uh, with our audiovisual team here this morning. We'll be putting it on the community channels throughout Alberta. I'll be sending it to my counterpart in Calgary and uh, we'll be getting it on, on as many community stations as we can uh, several times. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll have you look to the dial. I'll let our, our friends at ATA know uh, when it's airing so that they can maybe put that on the website and you can spread the news far and wide that for people who couldn't be here this morning, they can watch on Shaw. And if you're with one of our competitors, maybe you just need to switch. <laughs> So well, let's get started. I'd like to introduce the panelists today. Dr. David Swan is the interim leader of the Alberta Liberal Party. <laughs> Darren Billis is the education critic and MLA for Edmonton Beverly Clairview with the Alberta New Democratic Party. <laughs> well, that's actually Alberta's NDP, is that right? Me. Is the branding actually Alberta's NDP? Yes. Because we don't want to be confused with the folks in Ottawa, is that it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that, yeah. Well, we're glad you're here. And Sharon Smith, the candidate for Leduc Beaumont Wild Rose Party. <laughs> here are the uh, basic uh, ways that we're going to roll out this morning. We'll start with opening statements and then we will have three thematic sections and they will be based on education funding, education policy, and the teaching profession. Within each of those three sections there will be answers from our panelists to prepared questions, followed by a question from our audience. Questions were submitted last night and chosen in a way to achieve a balance of topics and geography. After that, four questions on other topics and then closing statements. We want to encourage dialogue and discussion. In some cases, the speaking order is determined. In other cases, we will uh, open it up and we're looking forward to a great morning. So we'll start with a two-minute maximum opening statement from each representative, and we'll begin with the Alberta Liberal Party. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Thank you, members of the ATA. 
It's a real pleasure and honor for me to be here once again. I want to acknowledge Greg Clark, leader of the Alberta Party, who's running against the uh, Minister of Education. Greg? I'm sure he would welcome. <clears throat> I'm sure he would welcome your support in Calgary Elbow. I want to ask a question. What is it that the progressive conservatives don't understand about democracy? Once again, they're not here. That question needs to be asked to not only the representative, the education minister, but also to the premier. I am pleased to be here again. I'm a father, grandfather, ten grandchildren now. I'm really blessed. And once again, the leader of the Alberta Liberals. Again, because I cannot abide the profound loss of direction, the loss of integrity, the loss of the priority of the, for the public good that I see in this government. I'm here again because the proverbial writing is on the wall. People without vision perish, along with their children and their future. I'm here again because I see people giving up on our democratic rights and responsibilities. Our parents fought and died for the right to speak and to make different choices. Growing income inequality, impoverished families that Mark mentioned. 46% of our children under the age of five are delayed in one of five key developmental indicators as this government cuts. New Canadians are unable to succeed and give back almost one and a half billion dollars in deferred maintenance in our schools. We're this government has spent all of our non-renewable resource <clears throat> wealth in a single generation and are prepared to blame others for now going into major debt. I'll have more to say about this. Darren Billis, NDP. Well, thank you, Jennifer, and I'll thank Mark and uh, all the, the folks at the ATA for, uh, for having me uh, here for another panel. It's, uh, it's my pleasure. And so I'd like to begin by bringing greetings on behalf of, uh, of Rachel Notley, the leader of Alberta NDP, uh, and to say proudly that not only am I a new Democrat MLA, uh, I'm also a teacher and a card-carrying member of the ATA. I'm happy to be here to talk with you about teaching and education because these two issues are extremely important, though perhaps less so for the minister himself as uh, he couldn't make the time to be here. While there are many important issues that I could talk about, I want to talk briefly in this opening about inclusive education in Alberta schools. As teachers, you see firsthand the changing face of Alberta's classrooms. You, your teaching assistants are doing some incredible work and the supports that you have with you uh, dealing with the increasing diversity and complexity within your classrooms. The Blue Ribbon Panel on Inclusive Education makes it clear that Alberta teachers are dealing with more and more special needs students, English language learners, and students with complex mental health issues. We need to make sure that you, that teachers, are getting enough support and training to deal with these difficult issues and to ensure that all students in our schools are successful. We also need to stand up for teachers uh, and to reduce your workload. And we'll talk a little bit later about the legislated contract that was forced upon you, our position and, and that effect it's had. But we need to do this because I believe we have the best education system in the world. And it is not because of this PC government, it's because of you, our teachers. Thank you. Sharon Smith, Wild Rose. Good morning. I'm so pleased to be here to represent the Wild Rose Party, and I would like to bring greetings from our leader, Heather Forsyth, who wishes she could be here today. My husband, Rick, is also a card-carrying member of the ATA. I have worked in your classrooms, and I have a son with special needs. I've been on ground zero. One of the reasons I sought the nomination for the Wild Rose in my constituency is because my husband is a teacher. 
I have a pretty personal understanding of some of the challenges in the education system and have seen firsthand the extraordinary efforts of educators to do the best they can in difficult circumstances. Our schools are overcrowded. Our teachers are expected to do more with ever-decreasing resources. And despite the best efforts of teachers, parents, and students, it's becoming more difficult for our students to reach their full potential in our education system. The Wild Rose believes in a strong education system that has sustainable and predictable funding, and, and instead of just promising to build schools, that government should actually build schools. I truly believe that when you invest in education and make it a priority, you invest in a positive future for students and our province. We all understand the tough fiscal situation the province finds itself in, but let's not fool ourselves. The reason we're in this tough spot is not because of the price of oil. When oil was selling for $120 a barrel, it was no different. We are in this spot because we have a government that cannot be trusted to keep their promises and a government that cannot be trusted to put Albertans' best interests ahead of their own political interests. How many times have they promised new schools before an election and not delivered? How many times have they promised predictable funding before an election and not delivered it? I honestly believe that the first step to improving our education system is by electing MLAs who you can count on to keep their promises and a government you can trust. And that's time. Thank you. We'll begin now with the first of the three themed sections, this one on education funding. We'll start with a prepared response to a written question. Participants have received this question in advance. Each participant will have one minute to respond and then we will open up the discussion to the whole group. The question is, by next year the student population in Alberta will have grown by 90,000 students compared to 2008. Unstable and inadequate education funding has meant that the number of teaching positions have not kept up with this growth. Class sizes are growing to the highest levels that we have seen since 2002 in this province. And next year we could be facing the loss of another 2,500 teaching positions. What will a government under your leadership do to ensure stable, predictable, and adequate funding for schools? We'll begin with the NDP. Excuse me. Excellent. Thank you for the question. Um, I think, uh, you know, first of all, what makes me really frustrated and part of the reason I got into politics was we see how much our province is growing. We know the birth rates in Alberta are among highest in the country. Uh, and we've known this for years, and yet the PCs have continued to drag their feet on investing in new schools. Uh, there was a, a period of time where, uh, well, I can tell you when Mr. Lukasik was education minister, there were no new schools built. Um, and so we're trying to play catch up, but the, the point of it is that not only does our education system need stable, predictable funding, we need adequate classrooms uh, for our students. I, I vehemently disagree with, you know, 45 kids in a, in a kindergarten class, kids being bused all over the city uh, because there's insufficient uh, spaces. Uh, and then again, of course, uh, attacking you and, and cutting down on teachers means larger class sizes and makes things like inclusive education even more difficult. Um, and so uh, education should be at the top of the list as far as a priority. It is an investment. It is not a cost. And uh, this government has failed to adequately invest in education for decades. And that's time. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, the Wild Rose. There are a number of challenges when it comes to education funding. One of the most foundational principles of Wild Rose is making sure that government spending is predictable and sustainable. This starts with how budgets are managed, how fast spending escalates, and when reductions are needed and where those reductions happen. Wild Rose has consistently said that our education system should be a top priority for government spending. This means that the goal should be steady increases that follow inflation and population growth. The government has mismanaged finances in such a way that our frontline services have paid the price. Unpredictable funding is hard on everyone involved, and our children and their teachers pay the price for this yo-yo budgeting. Thank you. Alberta Liberal Party. Thank you. 
This government has spent all the non-renewable resource wealth generated in this province in the last 30 years. This is a travesty of governance. 6% only has been saved, and that is almost gone. And we're headed towards a $21 billion debt by 2017, if we continue on the growth plan, the infrastructure plan that we see. I asked Mr. Prentice and the education minister in the House last week how they could justify cutting public education again. Our children's potential, our province's future, while giving last year $11.6 billion more, $11.6 billion more than any other province to the corporate sector in this province. They responded that this tax advantage attracts jobs and corporations. I'm sorry, children, our future are the priority. It's time to get serious about reforming our tax structure and ensuring that we have a stable, predictable funding for the essentials in our society. That's one minute. We'll open it up to five minutes of open discussion. You're so polite. It's I'll, I'll, <laughs> jump, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in uh, because I know this is, uh, you know, David and I uh, have talked about this and, and this is where New Democrats and Liberals are similar uh, as far as where do we get the funding from. You know, I think most Albertans that I've talked to are quite upset that when Prentice talks about Albertans having to look in the mirror um, and, and puts the onus back on you and on us and hardworking families, he, he's refusing to, to ensure that corporations pay their fair share. And so in Alberta, we have a 10% corporate tax rate, the lowest in the country. Uh, what we are proposing is a 2% tax, corporate tax increase, to put us to 12%, which is still among the lowest in the country, still very competitive, but it would bring in at least a billion dollars a year into the government coffers. Uh, starting with that and moving to a fair taxation system so that we stop punishing middle class, working families, and we ensure that everyone in this province pays their fair share. I think we can all agree that uh, there are many places that we can find dollars and cents that have been wasted. I think, you know, when we look back in, in terms of mismanagement of cell phone use with Alberta Health Services, when we look at all the money that's being spent on paying consultants, uh, that money can be used in better areas that we can prioritize and put into places like education. I don't think there's any institution that does a better job of managing its money than, than education. I see school teachers, I see kindergarten teachers that do projects where they collect milk jugs to, to build an igloo and then take, it, take the milk jugs after and sell them so that they can fund their field trips. <coughs> teachers are amazing when it comes to making something out of nothing. And I think it's time that education is not something where we can cut corners. It is our priority. There may be indeed inefficiencies. We've pointed out a number of them, up to seven or eight hundred million dollars, including the healthcare system, which is the most expensive healthcare system in the country and not delivering. There may indeed be funds related to public dollars going to private schools, which the Alberta Liberals have consistently said has to stop. There may be issues in relation to carbon capture and storage or uh, the runaway costs on the South Campus Hospital in Calgary, which was long overdue and much over budget. It doesn't add up to $11.6 billion more that we are giving back to corporations and the wealthy every year in this province instead of investing it in the people and the infrastructure that we need in this province. I would say that the most profound failure of this government is its unwillingness or its inability to address this inequity in taxation. We are giving away the farm in this province. And we and our children and our grandchildren, or what we like to call Martha and Henry's grandchildren, we are going to pay a deep price for this. And I think more and more people are getting agitated about this. I hope, and I've spoken to many different parent councils now in Calgary, many of them are getting to the point where they're actually ready to start hitting the streets. 
This is a defining issue in this coming election, as I see it. People are fed up with oversized classrooms, high school fees, uh, challenges for their uh, English as a second language or ELL programs. Uh, this is not acceptable. Uh, 30 children in a kindergarten in one of my schools in, in Calgary. This is a defining issue. I think this is one that the government will back off on. Uh, we can stop this 9% in education. I think it's simply a question of helping organize and mobilize people. This is doable. This would be a defining issue in this election and I want to make it so. Well and you know to piggyback on that what makes me so frustrated is, is when I hear Prentice use words like you know we have to do more with less you know and looks to the education system which you know my blood levels just rise up because I mean you as teachers know better than most people having to do more in your day, take on more, your workload has gone up, yet your own personal compensation has been zeros for three years, which uh, I just want to say that when the government legislated your contract in the House, in the Chamber, there were only four votes against it. And that was the Alberta NDP that said, that is not how you negotiate, and forcing zeros on people is, is simply unacceptable. And that's five minutes. The next question on education funding will come from one of the teachers in our audience. The Wild Rose Party will be able to respond first, followed by the Liberal Party and then the NDP. And we'll have uh, five minutes for this discussion. Here is Kristen, who is a special needs teacher from Calgary. Hi. Just wanted to say thank you for being here. Um, and as was mentioned, I am a special education teacher, and I'm concerned about class composition and the lack of supports for regular education teachers. So what can be done about this? Absolutely. Thank you for your question. And as a mother of a special needs child, I can tell you that um, I, I have been in the classroom. I have worked in special needs classrooms. My husband has been a special needs teacher. And absolutely, we just need to prioritize that funding to make sure, I mean, all of these students come with additional funding. We need to make sure that these programs are well-funded. If we're expecting inclusivity, we may need to make sure that we can back up that inclusivity with the funding that's required. And as a Wild Rose um, party, that's something that would be a priority for us. Thank you. Misplaced priorities. <clears throat> That's what I see recurrently in this government. They've acknowledged that in closing some of the long-term institutional care for persons with disabilities, that uh, they need to have a more vibrant connection to the community and a, a more living uh, experience in a community. And yet they haven't provided the supports and the funding, whether it be in the community or in the school system, uh, this government has failed to really put in place a plan and then fund the plan and then monitor the plan to see how it's working and then evaluate changes that can be made. It's a, a very basic sequence that you're used to doing in your classrooms every day, uh, monitoring how children are doing on their education plan and evaluating in various d dimensions and helping them to find the ways to succeed. This government has not looked at those basic dimensions of managing a program, managing a service, managing a province in a systematic way. They have lost their way. And this is part of what you'll hear recurrently, I think, at this table, is a recognition, and me, after 11 years of watching and studying and learning about how this government makes decisions, they base their decisions on their priorities. And then they find the evidence to support their priorities. It's not evidence-based decision-making, it's decision-based evidence-making. Hmm. Uh, thank you, Kristen, for that, uh, for that question. And, um, you know, ensuring that we have adequate funding and resourcing for our classrooms, uh, especially today, is, uh, is definitely one of my priorities. Um, you know, and again, I talk about class size and class composition because of the interplay between the two of them. I mean, with the sheer numbers in the classroom, it means you have less one-on-one -on -one time with all of your students 
Then when you start adding in the different varying levels of needs, uh, from special needs students to ELL students, uh, to students with, uh, with mental health issues, uh, your classrooms become uh, increasingly and increasingly more complex. Um, for us, I mean, it's, it's definitely a matter of, of, of making this a priority and investing in our classrooms, giving you the tools that you need to be successful. So we're ensuring that you're not, we don't have classrooms with one teacher and 30 students and five of them are special needs and you have a couple ELL students, no teacher's aides, no supports. Um, and again, you're, you're asking to juggle all of these different things uh, simultaneously. I think the province has not taken your workload seriously. I think they're not uh, providing adequate funding for uh, support staff, teachers' aides. Drives me up the wall that whenever we hear of cuts, those are the first positions to get cut. The ones that ensure that you, your students, and their classmates are successful. And so that needs to be a priority. That needs uh, additional funding. I would argue that inclusive education has actually seen a decrease in funding uh, over the last few years. Uh, which, uh, again, you know, as soon as we take dollars from the classroom, the impact that has is significant. It's not just on that one student. It affects their classmates. It affects you and the job that you can do. It affects their families. It affects their future. It affects the future of this province, which is why whenever there are cuts or proposed cuts to education, I get so upset because it is so short-sighted. We need to be investing dollars in our students, in our classrooms, in you, to ensure that we do remain the most competitive jurisdiction in the world. Thank you. We have and 15 I, seconds left. I guess one of the reasons we're here today as well is to hear from you and hear from you how we can do better. Thank you. We'll now have responses to another prepared question, one minute each, followed by a five minute open dialogue. The next themed section is on education policy. Once again, we start with the prepared response. Um, the question is, in recent years, the government has signaled a new direction for education in Alberta based on the work done through the Inspiring Education Initiative. That new direction has resulted in significant projects related to curriculum redesign, provincial testing, high school redesign, and other areas. Do you feel that these directions are appropriate? Which ones should move forward? Which ones should be adjusted? We'll start with the NDP, followed by the Wild Rose, and then the Liberals. Okay, I'm happy to start. Did I start on the last one as well? Sorry, sure? bear with me. We, I have the PCs being pulled out as we go along. Ah, okay, fair <laughs> enough. I'm happy to, uh, I'm happy to chat. <laughs> All right, so this is question number two. This is the recap on the Inspiring Ed and curriculum design and provincial achievement tests and all that. Okay, well, uh, I've been quite vocal over the last couple of years when it comes to curriculum redesign. Um, you know, I think that we need to, uh, to do that as an ongoing uh, tool, which we do. My understanding of curricular redesign is it normally takes four to five years and we do it one grade at a time. And so when the provincial government said, we are going to redesign K-12 to in an overhaul all in a year and a half, I thought, oh Lord, that uh, I can only imagine your panic, because I'm thinking, okay, as a teacher, you need to relearn uh, the five, six subjects that you teach and the different grades that you teach all simultaneously. I don't think that's a responsible way to go forward. Curriculum redesign needs to happen uh, and should be ongoing. You definitely need to be at the table. Uh, but it needs to be done in a way that, uh, that is a little more realistic so that there is time for it to roll out properly and efficiently and not just dumping new curriculum on you in August to learn for September to try to plan your, your, your years around. Uh, provincial testing, we've, uh, we've always advocated we should be using diagnostic uh, exams to uh, assess our students, which would then give you the information to help uh, meet their needs and teach them throughout the school year as opposed to a, a provincial achievement exam. And that's I know time. that that's oh. time. <laughs> See, and for I want to record, talk about SLAs, but I'll come back to that. 
for the record, uh, Sharon did start last time. You just are doing a lot of talking. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what we're here for. <laughs> so thank you. Um, it, is, it is fair, so far as I can tell. Um, so the Wild Rose. When it comes to curriculum redesign, we believe that it's the Alberta Teachers Association that should take the lead. You are the professionals. What we've taken exception to is the idea that we need to change everything. We have a policy right now that puts teachers in the driver's seat when it comes to a method of instruction, and we don't feel that the Department of Education should be able to use a document like this to impose solutions that do not work for teachers. We have seen inquiry-based instruction in the math curriculum since 2008, and the results have clearly raised questions about the method and whether it should be used all the time for every subject and for every age group. This is why it's important to make sure that teachers are in the driver's seat when it comes to methodology. Thank you. Dr. Swan. I've been encouraged by the notion of inquiry-based education. Uh, in fact, helping people to learn how to think, how to solve problems, seems superior to me and it certainly was part of the medical curriculum to solve problems in an inquiry-based format, rather than learning what to think and what is important to know. In fact, I think that would be a great curriculum for the PC government to engage in. <laughs> Groupthink and ideology trump everything in this government. And while I have been inspired by some of the excellent principles and values in the inspiring education document. Principles like being engaged, being ethical, and being entrepreneurial, being innovative, fair, respectful, empathetic, being disciplined, working towards excellence, and challenging the status quo are, some, are principles that most of us would abide by. The problem is the process. When I was a physician practicing in the Philippines for a year and a half, we could always get the results we wanted to get children vaccinated. And the way the companies uh, achieved that was they said to the families, you don't get your paycheck every month if your children aren't vaccinated. It's possible to achieve goals by forcing people to do things. It's not possible to get their respect, to achieve dignity and achieve fairness by imposing solutions on people. That's, that's the fallacy of the approach this government continues to take. And that's time. Five minutes now to continue. Okay, I'm totally going to jump in on this. Uh, <laughs> your, uh, your example, uh, Dr. Swan, again, makes me think of, of the, uh, the bad faith bargaining that the PCs had when it came to your teaching contracts. And again, as opposed to negotiating with you, uh, when it didn't go the way they wanted it to, they said, okay, well, we're just going to force it upon you. Uh, which I think for a lot, of, a lot of you, a lot of teachers, uh, you obviously lost a great deal of respect. And part of it is that my understanding, teachers agreed to take three zeros or three years in a row of zeros if teaching workload was going to be addressed, if the size of your classes, your marking, your planning, all of it was going to be uh, on the table and talked about. And uh, I've heard that that has not been addressed. And uh, again, it's completely insulting to learn that Mr. Prentice is, is talking about even further cuts to education where you've already been working with a, a bare bones budget, so to speak. Um, I just want to jump back to curriculum redesign real quick because uh, you know something that we flagged and, and were very concerned about when the PCs first or Alberta Ed first put out curriculum redesign was the fact that for the first time ever in our history, uh, oil and gas companies were invited to sit at the table in curriculum redesign, uh, which I have a, a very big issue with the fact that, you know, I mean, Suncor and Apple want to sit down and help you write curriculum. What, where, where is that coming from? And what value, and I got into quite an exchange with the Minister of Education, Jeff Johnson, where I asked him what value does Suncor bring to the kindergarten curriculum? <clears throat> and he couldn't answer it, so he, result, he, he, rev, he, res, 
What's the word I'm looking for? Resorted. He responded or he turned to <laughs> personal attacks because he couldn't actually answer the question. And then uh, someone else did answer the question. They said, yeah, we need these oil companies to teach them how to think critically. And I scratched my head and said, what? No, we don't. Our teachers are more than capable of teaching students what they need to know. But opening up uh, corporations to having their hands in on what is being taught in school is very scary for me. Um, because again, it goes back to what is the purpose of education? Are we there just to train good little workers from the time they're in kindergarten to grade 12 and we're just going to slot them in an occupation and then they go off and work? Or is the value of education to, to help them become a person, uh, citizen engagement, to think critically, to have the tools and means to go on to whatever they want to do, not a prescriptive, uh, we're going to set you up to be uh, you know, a factory worker starting from the age of five. Uh, and last thing, because I'm sure my colleagues want to jump in on this, uh, it talks about direction of uh, Inspiring Ed, which I do think some of that document was good. I know and I will give respect uh, to uh, Mr. Hancock years ago when he was Education Minister, the work that he did on the Inspiring Ed document. Um, unfortunately, after the document, much of it wasn't necessarily implemented, and uh, once again, we have a great document. Uh, but we've been advocates of, of optional full-day kindergarten to ensure that families get the right start. I'm a big advocate of early childhood development and education. Those first five years are absolutely crucial, um, and the government needs to step up as far as, as funding and, and looking at ways to ensure that kids start or have the best starts. Now I'll shut up. Thank you. <laughs> Well, the early childhood education piece is close to my heart, uh, having grandchildren and having watched as medical officer of health in southern Alberta as growing numbers of children were, were inadequately prepared and supported through the preschool years. This government spent $5.5 .5 million doing the early childhood mapping in the last five years, mm -hmm. and with the profound insights that we have today uh, and the understanding of the, that Alberta children are, if anything, slightly less advantaged than the rest of the country in terms of early childhood milestones to now cut back the funding for this early childhood preparation for school is absolutely unacceptable and again I, I, I welcome uh, the, the support of both parents and union people in this area union people give me hope that there's a voice out there there's strength there's hope there's a determination to say not good enough we can fight this we can change the way things are done in this province. And I absolutely support unions in this province to continue to do that collective work of holding governments accountable, as we do in the legislature, speaking out, challenging, even going to the streets on issues like education. It, it is so profoundly important to all of us in our future that this is a hill to die on, as far as I'm concerned. Jennifer's being kind to me to, to let me jump in after the boys. But it, it's the uh, microphone situation, I feel for <laughs> you, so go ahead. <laughs> At any rate, I, I guess I feel very strongly as well about early education piece. And one of the things that I feel strongly about is when we look at our program unit funding that uh, sometimes carries our students for those first three years and then they get to the first grade and it falls off. And we see significant challenges for that first grade teacher when it comes to that funding falls off and all of a sudden we don't have occupational therapists in the classroom, we don't have speech therapists back in like we did during that program unit funding time. So that, that's something that I would advocate for very strongly. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> the next question on education policy will come from one of the teachers in the audience. We'll have uh, 10 minutes to discuss this. The Liberal Party will respond first, followed by the uh, NDP and then the Wild Rose. Um, this is Dennis. Dennis, are you here? Dennis is an administrator from Beaumont. Good morning. My question deals with the, uh, the current history of the PC government has isolated school boards from having any financial independence at the bargaining tables. Yet teachers are expected to bargain with boards. Has the time come to do away with school boards? 
What is your party's view with respect to local authorities that have no authority? Thank you very much for the question. This touches on the whole question of what we mean about democracy. How do we delegate authority and with authority responsibility? If we have, as we have, divested school boards of essential powers of, of uh, revenue generation and even some of the major decisions about infrastructure to, to the central government, which seems to be intent on centralizing power and decision making and minimizing any threats to their own independence, ideological agenda, uh, then we have a serious problem with our democratic process. And I guess the question for all of us as Albertans is whether we will accede to that, whether we will continue to see the erosion of democratic process in our gov government and in our province, and whether we will actually honor the commitment and the, and the votes uh, reflected in the votes of our citizens to elect uh, responsible school boards in this instance, or municipal councils is another example, and how they've been minimized in their ability to make decisions. Uh, whether we're going to stand up for that or whether we are going to continue to allow this erosion of decentralized decision making. It's fundamental to the democratic process that each of us feel our voice, our actions, our influence is expressed in our representatives. That's not the case today. I think it's time to revisit the whole question of powers in the, in the school boards and ensure that we maximize, not minimize and centralize the powers of decision making, including revenue generation should be on the table and discussed. Uh, it's, that's a great question and, and one which I would love to, uh, maybe after this morning, uh, to, to get some of your input uh, and feedback on that. Um, you know, I know historically uh, the reason that, uh, or at least the reason that is given on why school boards uh, no longer have the authority to raise funds uh, is because the province was saying, well, some areas were wealthy and school boards had a lot of money and others were very, very poor and so you really had uh, have and have not uh, schools and areas throughout the province, um, and I, you know, I do think that there's a role for uh, for the provincial government to play to ensure that we don't have, you know, bare bones schools versus, uh, you know, the Taj Mahal of of schools. Uh, but at the same time, I know from speaking to school boards, uh, you know, again, they're quite frustrated that, and they are given a limited pot of money and being forced to, to have to make decisions where they don't control the purse strings. They have no ability to generate dollars if there's a, a shortage. And so you get school boards then, uh, some of them looking at uh, levying school fees, which you know, essentially is a, a tax on, uh, on families to have to pay more in order for the school to get more. And, uh, you know, for me and for the New Democrats, we're definitely advocates of uh, local autonomy, local decision making. Um, it needs to happen at the grassroots because nobody knows better than the communities uh, that they live in and that they serve. You know, I'd love to see more cooperation between school boards and the cities, municipalities working with uh, school boards and obviously teachers when we're planning neighborhoods to have the foresight to be building a school as it's it's being developed. So putting developers on the hook, whether it's through a levy or uh, some form to ensure that, you know, at least the, the beginnings of a school is started. Because you look around on the outskirts of the cities um, and you've got barren fields where the PC said, yeah, school's under construction, which we had a heyday with this week, um, <clears throat> as far as if they consider construction taking a hammer and putting a sign in the ground, because apparently they do. Um, but what's frustrating is families that live in these communities are promised a school and they're, they're moving there under the guise of one day and one day soon. And for some of them, it's been years and years. Um, and uh, it's quite aggravating. I mean, for them and, and obviously for you as well, because you're dealing with the extra 15 students in your room that really should be in another school, another class. And I'm probably over time by now. You're good. Thank you. Well, there's clearly been an erosion of the um, authority, and this is something that the Wild Rose would like to hear more about from you. Um, the Wild Rose is very supportive of decentralization, not only in education, but in healthcare, and that's because we believe that the local authorities know the area, they know the issues, 
and they're the ones that are able to make the best decisions. So, you know, in, in that respect, I think we certainly um, support decentralization and, and putting, putting um, I, I guess we feel that the PCs have really let down school boards in some ways by not supporting them enough with funding and being able to place it back and, and you know, when, when the funds run out, they, they run out. So uh, it, it leaves school boards without options sometimes in terms of what they can do. So we are really about um, wanting to have more frank discussion with school boards and finding out where their needs are and where we can help them, I guess. Thank you. We'll move on to the next question. Uh, this one is a themed section, the beginning of our themed section on the teaching profession. Each participant, again, one minute to respond, then open an, up to the group for five. The question is, uh, and pardon me, we'll start with the Wild Rose and then go to the Liberals and MP NDP. The question is, last May, then Education Minister Jeff Johnson's Task Force for Teaching Excellence released its final report with recommendations on reforms to the teaching profession. How would your government act on the recommendations contained within that report? Sure. The Task Force for Teaching Excellence has some good recommendations, as well as some that we think need some more work in consultation. I understand that the ATA had some concerns about the process and ensuring that everyone is at the table and the Wild Rose is fully committed to listening to you as the experts. There were some recommendations that are certainly helpful and we think those should go forward. The task force talked about longer and more in-depth teaching practicums so that participants can discern their suitability for teaching and have a better context for in-class learning as they are doing and we believe that this is a great idea. Another recommendation that the Wild Rose supports is the idea of a province-wide mentorship framework to give teachers the support they need during the first three to five years of their careers. This means more support teachers and more help so that new teachers stay in the field. I know one of the questions that the ATA often fields in the first month of uh, the school year is, how do I get out of my contract? That's and, time. Thank you. Liberals. Thank you. I believe our teachers are the experts in the field. However, the education system is already short thousands of teachers. If we look at the teacher per pupil ratio over the last five years, and we may lose up to 2,500 more teachers in the next year if the PCs get their way. This is more the question of today, is the resourcing of our schools and our teachers. The Minister's task force did pre present some interesting and, and helpful options for strengthening the capacity of teachers to do their jobs better. Unfortunately, it has become a distraction from the larger issue, which is how are we going to give teachers and ensure the supports they need for English language learning, high school fees, special education needs, and skyrocketing class sizes that are compromising every aspect of our education today. Thank you. One minute is not long enough. Uh, we had an issue with the process right from day one as far as who was struck for this task force, as far as the ATA wasn't invited, we weren't invited, other political parties weren't invited. We didn't get the input from everyone. Uh, our initial gut reaction was that this task force was struck as a way for the PCs to go after teachers. Uh, and we viewed it as an attack on teachers. Uh, when you have things like merit pay being floated, internships that are unpaid, so let's, let's exploit um, you know, non uh, or first or new teachers uh, right from the get-go, uh, not in favor of. As far as mentoring, it's a great concept. It does happen, and, and uh, maybe this is one of the things that gets cut first, but I know that we have had a lot of, of consultants that work as more mentor teachers with new teachers in the first couple of years. Uh, but, uh, you know, when this task force came out, I, I had a number of exchanges with Jeff Johnson about class sizes because they took the stance that it's all about having the best teacher in, at the front of the room, to which I responded, Alberta already has the best teachers. But uh, Jeff had said, no, 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 it's just you give the best teacher and it doesn't matter how many students are in the room. Uh, and I thought, wow, here's an education minister that has no clue what the hell he's talking about. Uh, 
which unfortunately that's not the first time I said that. <laughs> uh, and we'll begin our five minute open. Okay, so I'll just finish the thought, but uh, <laughs> this is a perk to going last here. Uh, no, the fact of the matter is you, you cannot argue that the number of students in a room affects the quality of instruction. And I said to Jeff, you know, just do the math, Jeff. Divide 20 students by one teacher. How much time does that teacher have to spend one-on-one? -on -one? Now double it. Now go 40 students. The one-on-one -on -one time diminishes. It drops down. And we're not even, we're not even yet talking about... Uh, class composition, which is then who is in your classroom, because some students obviously require more attention than others. But it, it frustrated me that this document was used to attack teachers to justify increasing class sizes when uh, I do believe that we need to continue to invest in you and teachers as professionals. Uh, but again, the irony with this is my perception is the PCs don't teach don't treat teachers as professionals and they need to recognize that you are professionals you are the experts you should be taking the lead when it comes to any kind of educational reform because you know best and so um, I will leave it at that and see if my colleagues up here have any comments well the, the first thing that comes to mind when I read this was so we don't have money for schools. We have overcrowded classrooms. And now, we're going to put another layer on teachers and administrators? Where's the money coming from for this? Where are the resources coming from this? Why don't we focus on getting our physical classrooms laid out? Why don't we get our uh, enough teachers hired first before we're spending money and resources on, on issues, on things that we can't even, we can't even get to. So that was one of the first things that came to mind when I was reading this, is that I already know that teachers are overtaxed. Um, you're doing all you can with what you have. And uh, Jeff Johnson was not a friend to teachers. He was not a friend to the ATA. And so um, I think what we would do, what the Wild Bros would do is we would go back to the table. We would go back to the table and we would consult with you, the professional educator, and find out what reforms will work, what are realistic in the classroom. And um, my Wild Rose colleagues and I, we support the ATA as is. Separating union from association is not something that we support. Separating principles from the ATA is also something that we do not support. So um, in regards to that, that, that is our, our stand. A recurring theme I think you'll hear from all of us is, and I know that you've experienced it, is the terms consultation used by this government, whether it's with local municipalities, whether it's with First Nations, whether it's with uh, the medical profession, uh, or whether it's with teachers. The, the word consultation is used to mean informing and getting consent. This government doesn't really understand the meaning of authentic consultation, inclusive discussion, open to change. It has a fixed agenda when it goes into meetings, and that was reflected in this report, where all of these uh, recommendations, although some of them very interesting and important to discuss and debate and need to be uh, clarified. Uh, it's very clear to me that there's an agenda going in and until this government recognizes that the process stinks in most cases of what it does in terms of consulting with groups and, and the public and the democratic process, it undermines trust. It doesn't build trust. It, it undermines the ability of people to feel they can make a difference and have some influence and are authentically heard uh, by their representatives. What's happened in this province, I'm afraid, is that the people have become afraid of the government instead of the government being afraid of the people. And that's time. Thank that's you. That's the beginning of the end of democracy, when people fear their government. We have to start being more strident and speak out on the issues that we care about. The next question on the teaching profession will be read from the floor. Uh, once again, we will have... Uh, Five minutes open. 
And the question, uh, we'll begin with the Liberals responding to the question, followed by the NDP and the Wild Rose. Here is Isabel, who is a grade six teacher from Edmonton. Bonjour, c'est un plaisir d'être ici ce matin. Uh, my question is, how would your political party ensure that teachers' workload is truly looked at and improved? Thank you, Isabel. Was that teacher workload? How would I ensure that teacher workload was looked at and addressed? That's a pretty fundamental question of, of any leadership team, to look at what the expectations of the job are, what the resources to achieve success are, and how we're matching the demands with the results. Again, I go back to, to an earlier comment about putting in place goals, the plan, monitoring the plan, and evaluating the plan, and changing as needed. It's very clear from everything I've heard from teachers and from parents, uh, not to mention some students, that the classroom has become way too burdened uh, in terms of demands, social, health issues, uh, financial issues coming into play, family issues, community issues, uh, many complex uh, issues quite apart from the didactic and, and content issues that you have to try to communicate and, and transmit in the classroom. We need to have a, a specific commitment to addressing this, not in general, but in very specific ways, because every school is different uh, as, as the composition varies between uh, greatly. Uh, I'm, I'm seeing just the dramatic changes in Calgary where new Canadians have, are over 50% of some of the classrooms that I'm aware of. So that's a very good question, and I don't see any plan at present to address this. How can a government make plans to cut education when they have no idea what the burden is already on classrooms and how the burden on teachers is affecting their health, their ability to do their jobs? And as I, as I can relate in the healthcare system, we have one of the largest sick leave uh, rates among our health workers of any occupation in Canada. We're not taking care of the people who are providing the frontline services in this province. We have to address this if we're going to achieve the quality and consistency in education that I think we all deserve and we all want for our future. Darren. Uh, merci beaucoup pour votre question, Isabelle. Um, I think, you know, workload uh, is broken down in a, in a few different uh, ways. I mean, obviously, uh, class size affects workload. The more students you have, the more marking you're doing, the more uh, IPPs you're doing, the more um, time that you're investing in planning, preparing, marking. Uh, and so that uh, contributes to it. Again, looking at the composition of our classes also affects workload. So when we've moved toward more inclusivity with our classrooms, uh, which I'm, a, I'm an advocate of as long as the resources follow uh, and teachers are, and schools are supported. Um, I've got uh, a couple very uh, vocal constituents of mine who are uh, parents or mothers of, of children with severe special needs. Um, and, uh, you know, they've said to me time and time again, our classrooms cannot be dumping grounds. We can't just dump kids that we don't know what else to do with or there isn't the resources to adequately support them. So, hey, let's just drop them into uh, Ms. Smith's class and she can deal with them. Um, we need to ensure that there are adequate resources support staff working with you and with teachers, uh, not just for students with special needs, but again, when we look at workload. Um, I think as well, um, you know, earlier I talked about uh, provincial achievement exams, which we are advocates of diagnostic exams, but I have heard loud and clear from a lot of teachers how much of a nightmare the SLAs were to implement this year as far as the work that it put back on you. There were lots of questions. I, I don't think the government did the best job rolling it out uh, and giving you the support. And so I heard from a lot of teachers the amount of hours they were putting into the SLAs on top of in September, you're trying to get your, your classrooms ready um, and your, your new faces uh, prepared. Um, I can only you know, tip my hat to you as far as the amount of work that you do. And the uh, last minute to the Wild Rose. Thank you. Well, the current studies are shown that right now this workload that is, it's unsustainable. Uh, 
So I think what we need to do is we need to take a closer look at what you are doing now that you don't need to be doing. This may be one of the most important um, items that we can look at in, in terms of reducing teacher workloads. Teachers don't get overtime. You spend uh, hours into the night grading. Some of you spend your weekends and evenings coaching. And I'm not sure the PC government recognizes that. I know my, in my own personal home, when we got to Christmas time, that was a big milestone. And <clears throat> my husband would sleep for the first three days. When you get to summer holidays, you spend the first week just finding your legs again. I know what this looks like at Ground Zero. Time. So I think what we need to, to address this is, again, be in consultation with you. And we hope that's something you'll be able to trust us for. Thank you. We'll move into our next section now, which is discussion on a variety of other topics. Uh, these will be related to education or even more general in nature. Each question will be read from the floor. Uh, Kevin is our first up, if you'd like to make your way to the microphone. Uh, one party has been designated to open the response, and after that, it will be open for anyone to discuss, so feel free to jump in. Um, the first question will begin with the NDP, and Kevin is a teacher in the junior high LA and social studies area from Calgary. Hello. What is your party's plan to build a sustainable economy and use the wealth created by Albertans to fund social programs such as education in a way that's commensurate with the needs and the growth of Alberta's population? Thanks, Kevin. That's a great question. Uh, a sustainable economy is one that isn't reliant on the price of oil to determine whether grandma gets a hip or we get a new classroom. Um, I think it's ridiculous uh, and ironic that the government just the other day realized that, oh my God, we need to get off the oil royalty roller coaster. And all of us are sitting around scratching our heads saying, yes, we were saying that for decades. So, you know, first of all, to have stable, predictable income, increase corporate taxes by 2% to make sure that everyone in Alberta is paying their fair share. Move to a progressive income tax system where, again, you're not punishing middle class families and, and middle income earners, we're talking about making adjustments on households that are, you know, $120,000, $130,000 and more and have the small increments going up, but ensuring that the wealthiest Albertans are still paying their fair share and not getting a free ride. We would look at uh, uh, um, royalties. Uh, Alberta charges the lowest royalty rate in uh, North America, not just in Canada. And so there is much room for us to have competitive rates. We're not going to be gouging uh, industry, but uh, looking at them paying their fair share, collecting the royalties that are owed to us. Believe it or not, the government has money on the table that they're not collecting that are owed to Albertans. And diversifying the economy, investing in education, investing in, in the knowledge economy and post-secondary, uh, putting more resources toward alternative forms of energy. We have a brilliant amount of sunlight and wind, uh, especially in southern Alberta. And so we should be... Uh, diversifying the economy, building up our savings account. Uh, the heritage savings account is still extremely low and pathetic when you compare it to a place like Norway, which has over a trillion dollars. Uh, we have about 18 billion. Uh, so savings and then investing in uh, our programs and services that Albertans rely on. And investing in education, I would argue, uh, does have a return uh, not just a social return, but there is an economic return by ensuring that our students have the best quality of education. Uh, that will help Alberta and our future. And it's open to either one of you. Thank you, Kevin. I think that's uh, the overarching question that as government we have to come to grips with. Uh, sustainability to me means living in a fashion that doesn't compromise future generations. And it focuses my attention on the limits to our environment. Uh, everything we do economically and socially has to be limited by the capacity of our environment to absorb our activities and our consumption and our needs. And that then shifts us to this question about how we sustain people, people who are responsible for both caring for the environment and for caring for each other in a way that allows all of us to thrive and, and reach our potential. 
the third tier of a sustainable future has to then look at the economy. How are we generating wealth? How are we generating the material goods and the services that we need to sustain ourselves? And there, I, I would have to agree almost completely with Darren. We have to have a fair tax structure. We have to invest in the things that both protect our environment and protect people. And we have to ensure that we develop a longer term view than this government has been willing to do, which is election to election uh, and look at alternate forms of energy and technology and invest in post-secondary education and ensure that we are in the, in the context of healthy people and healthy communities examining how our relationships are affecting our ability to create the conditions for health in our communities and ensure that we are indeed uh, building the capacity of people to live healthy and productive lives. Those are, those are general principles, but if we don't look at those three dimensions, the, the physical environment and our limits, the, uh, the uh, social environments and how we're creating safe and healthy, inclusive, respectful populations, and then look at how our economy can be more diverse, we're not well, going to even approach sustainability. We'll look for uh, the last 30 seconds to hear from the Wild Rose. We've always maintained that Alberta doesn't have a revenue problem. Alberta has a spending problem. And I think we need to prioritize our spending. We need to take care of our dollars and watch where our pennies are going. One example, $1 billion goes towards carbon capture. That's 75 new schools. We need to prioritize our spending, align our revenues. That's how we could look at a more sustainable future. Thank, Thank you. you. The next question comes from Ken, who teaches grades one through eight. And I have to admit, I've been in Albertan for 15 years, but I'm not sure how to say the community you're from. Batha. Batha. Thank you. Sorry. This one will begin with the Wild Rose and then open. Uh, good morning and thank you for being here to take our questions today. Uh, with regards to the future of the teaching profession and public sector workers in general, it seems whenever the economy slows down, we become a target for the need to show restraint and we face cutbacks. And so my question is, how do you think this will affect Alberta's ability to attract competent, qualified personnel to provide these important services in the future? especially when in booming times the private sector jobs are more appealing, lucrative, and then when we're in the downturns, the public sector jobs are restrained. Mm -hmm. Thank you. In regards to education, this is not an area that it, it shouldn't change. Whether we're in a boom or whether we're in a bust, education needs to stay the same. That's why we're saying that education needs to be a priority. We're used to boom and bust. This is Alberta. We have oil in the ground. That's like having money in the bank. So, you know, I think this is something that we've gone through before. It shouldn't matter. The point is that what we need to do is we need to make a sustainable, predictable plan so that education can count on what, where their dollars are going to be, what their dollars are going to be, and have a good, solid educational plan going forward. Thank you. Who's next? We'll start with the Liberals. Oh, pardon me, Liberals? We, we were looking for you guys to fight it out, but we yeah. can stick with the order if you like. We do enough <laughs> of that in the legislature. <laughs> True. Yeah. This is a civilized audience here. <laughs> we say the government has both a revenue problem and a spending problem. In other words, we have a management problem in this province. And the lack of leadership, longer term vision, is crippling our province, giving us a bad reputation internationally and threatening our most salient industry, our, our, most, our foundational economy, which is the oil industry. It's not the oil industry that's done the damage. It's the government that has failed to set in place some standards, monitor those standards, enforce those standards, and penalize those that don't uh, achieve the standards that have shot us in the foot uh, from an international point of view. We all need the fossil fuels and we will need them for a couple of decades. The question is how are we managing them and how are we using the, the resources? We clearly need to stop the blame game and Mr. Prentice gave us a gift if you want for democracy. 
anybody who's thoughtful about our economy and our province knows that this government has to take responsibility for the economic state that we're in today. Not you, not me. We have done our best as citizens to provide the services and the resources and strengthen our communities in whatever ways we can. And this government now has turned to us to make the difference of up to $7 billion that's now we're in the hole. That's unacceptable. And I think this will be the galvanizing force that moves people out of their seats, into the streets, and into the ballot boxes in a month or six weeks' time. I hope it will. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to go about this reverse. So I'm going to talk, uh, Ken, thanks for your question about the, the future of the teaching profession. And I can tell you that um, if things don't change, uh, I'm very concerned about uh, the future of the teaching profession. Uh, with, you know, the workload that you folks have, and uh, again, the fact that for years you've been accepting zeros, which, make no mistake, a zero is not a zero, it's a, it's a cut, it's a rollback. You're, you're getting less money because of uh, inflation, uh, and so inflationary dollars, you're behind by about 7% from the last three years. Uh, you know, it's, so I look at the statistic, and I think I was talking to, uh, to Mark about it, uh, in the first five years, the number of teachers who either don't go into a classroom to teach or leave the teaching profession is like 30%. That's scary as hell, because we need you in our classrooms. But clearly, our, our current system is not working. And again, it's leading to teacher burnout. Uh, or, or those of you who just want to leave the profession because you go, you know what, my, my heart is here, but I'm tired of going home in tears every day because I can't provide the, the assistance and the time for each of my students, and they need it, and they deserve it. And so it makes me angry as hell that the PCs turn their guns always first to teachers and public sector workers. And in the last year, they had four different attacks on our public sector, bills 9 and 10 and 45 and 46. And I can tell you that there were two parties in the legislature that vehemently fought against all four of those bills. Um, and that obviously was us and, and the Liberals. And I apologize to my Wild Rose colleague, but Bill 9, when uh, they went after private sector pensions, you guys were just great with it. So, I mean, my issue was, no, we, we can't be attacking pensions, period. This is the retirement security. This is what you've worked for. Uh, this is part of your remuneration. And so, um, you know, the public service is... Uh, the folks that help make this province go round and round and are one of my concerns and I'll make this quick is if we attack the public service and we reduce either their their pension or their benefits or their wages uh, that we will have fewer and fewer people wanting to go into the public sector because that they're gonna say right. what's the point I'm gonna go to the private sector because the public sector is not competitive at all and so if we want the best and brightest then we need to ensure that we're funding it and funding it time. adequately Thank you. Thank you. The, ne okay. the next question comes from Sam, who is a classroom support teacher well. yeah. in Fort McMurray. And we'll begin, we'll begin with the Liberals this time. Hi. Uh, my question is, can you explain why your party is ready to govern? Why? Why? Who's Liberals. First? Why? That is the most profound question in politics. I can tell you why I'm running and why the Liberals stand for inclusive, respectful, visionary governance. It's our province. I love this province. I have, as I indicated, 10 grandchildren. I was thinking of retiring this year, but when I saw that I would be the only opposition member of any stripe left in Calgary, I said, I can't do this. I can't walk away. No opposition, another blank check for this Prentice government for four years, no way. We deserve better. This is about our future, and, and this is a critical time, and I hope every one of you will take seriously your democratic responsibility and engage with others and mobilize others in your community. This is a turning point in Alberta's history. Are we going to, we're already the longest government in history here. They're entrenched, they're 
out of touch, they're not connecting with people and listening. Uh, if there's anything that keeps me going, it's, it's a real passion to see change and at the very least to see a strong opposition. This government cannot go without accountability and opposition in the next four years. And with your help, we'll do that. Thank you very much. Darren, the NDP. Thank you. Uh, I'll give you two words of why we're ready to govern. Rachel Notley. Uh, I can tell you that uh, she's the, currently the only elected uh, permanent leader uh, out of three uh, or all the opposition parties. Uh, Rachel was elected last fall, and I can tell you that the energy that she brings uh, to the table, she's proven herself as a tireless advocate. She is incredibly intelligent and articulate. Um, and we are, uh, the Alberta NDP are the party on the move, and I know that we often don't put a lot of stock into polls, but I can tell you for the last year consecutively, we've been polling in first place in Edmonton, uh, which is significant. Now, I want to say to my friend David Swan here, you won't be the only opposition member in Calgary after this election. That's true. We have another eight liberals ready to ready. To <laughs> All right. You mean New Democrats? Um, we will. Uh, we will, and 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 plan to break into the scene not only in Calgary, also in Lethbridge, uh, and in other centers as well. But honestly, folks. Um, I am very excited about what I'm hearing on the doorstep, the number of people that, uh, that are moving to the NDP, people that are buying memberships. And I can tell you that I've been canvassing around the province with some of our candidates. And the number of people, and this is what gives me hope, the number of people who have said, I used to always vote PC, or I've only supported the PCs, I'm done with them. I'm done with the PCs, and I am looking for an alternative. And is, our last uh, minute's the Wild Rose. It's quite last exciting. Minute. Well, the Wild Rose were the party that took down Ed Stelmack, they took down Alison Redford, and we have been the most effective opposition party that Alberta has ever seen. We've, we've faced some setbacks recently. <laughs> <laughs> Prentice tried to take away our voice in this province, but our 24,000 members said, we're not going anywhere. We need, we need this opposition. We need somebody that is going to protect our province's coffers. We have fantastic candidates that have stepped up to the plate. I've never seen our party so energized, reinvigorated, ready to take on the PCs, and we will continue the work that we have always done, and we will continue to listen, to grow, and be prepared to govern Alberta on your behalf. Thank you. Thank you. We'll ask John from Camrose to come to the microphone, and while you get there, we'll just let the uh, NDP know that you'll be first up this time. And uh, John teaches humanities and drama in Camrose. Good morning. Uh, the Premier is outraged and has recently stated that there are unacceptable inequalities and opportunities between First Nations students and other students in Alberta. Though outraged, uh, none of his 70 elected PC MLAs could make time to attend this morning. How do you think the next Alberta government should address this concern? And that goes to the NDP first. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much. And you know what? This question is really, really timely because, and I'm definitely going to run out of time on this one. Um, <laughs> Yesterday, uh, the Premier had an announcement with the, uh, the two other treaty chiefs, or the three treaty chiefs, pardon me, of, of six, seven, and eight. Um, and I sat through it and listened, and they talked about, or he talked about the great conversation they were having and the work they need to do, uh, and then that was about it. And afterwards, uh, I can't ask the Premier questions during uh, his media availability, but I had with me a document uh, that's called the MOU, Memorandum of Understanding on First Nations Education, which was signed in 2010, by the province, the feds, 
and the uh, three grand, uh, grand chiefs. Nowhere did he reference this document. document has 42 commitments of working with uh, all orders of government to improve uh, education uh, and educational outcomes for uh, especially First Nations and other Indigenous uh, students for everything from high school completion rate to attendance, um, looking at addressing things like poverty or social determinants of health, um, all the barriers that, uh, that students face, looking at addressing curriculum and ensuring that, uh, that we are, which I know we are and we've made big progress as far as uh, bringing the Indigenous perspective into our curriculum, but teaching students about treaties, I mean a treaty affects every single person in this province, teaching them about residential schools, the impact that they've had and continue to have um, on uh, Indigenous peoples. And so, you know, for the Premier to say he's outraged, uh, but yet they've done nothing about it. This memorandum of understanding was signed five years ago, it's a 10 year memorandum. We're at the halfway point and they have no tangibles to show the progress that they're making. To me, it's frustrating that again, it's electioneering, it's talking about issues, it's making promises right before an election, hoping to get reelected, as opposed to actually addressing the issues that are facing especially First Nations students in our province and ensuring that the funding is there and the supports are there and not playing the blame game with the feds when they go back to their reserve to say, yep, it's no longer our jurisdiction because now they're federal and vice versa, where our, our federal schools actually uh, students receive less dollars than their provincial counterparts, which is absurd. And the province refuses to do anything about it, blaming the feds, where they need to show some leadership, like in Manitoba, the provincial government pays the differential. Because at the end of the day, it's about ensuring that our students have the best access to education. It's not about saying, no, I'm not paying because it's your responsibility. And with, thank, thank you. you, more than half our time gone, we'll let the Wild Rose jump in. We are tired about hearing the, of the Premier's outrage when they've not done anything in this term or in the entire time that they've governed this province. We believe that it's time that we work closely with our federal counterparts and work with our First Nations to help develop strategies that will help increase their attendance, their graduation rates, their post-secondary completion, and I think those answers lie in working with our First Nations communities. I believe that our education system has been failing our First Nations students. Uh, I believe that we need to teach them through cultural practices. And I think that's something that the Wild Rose really wants to work more closely with the First Nations and with educators in ensuring that um, we can deliver a first-class education to our First Nations students. Thank you. The Liberals. The First Nations in Alberta have been a marginalized and disadvantaged community that we're all paying a price for. And not only are they paying a huge price in terms of their own health and development and success and, and, and uh, wounds, but obviously we all share in that. And like the issue of poverty as it's reflected in mainstream society, we pay now or we pay later. If we don't lift up everyone to their optimal level of functioning and their, their ability to contribute, their ability to be all that they can be, then we all end up paying a huge price for that. And I think we've lost that ethic in, in Alberta that we're all in this together and that we deserve equality of treatment, equality of opportunity, equality of um, uh, respect. Racism is still alive and well in this province. Uh, we know that, and it's part of what you have to deal with, I'm sure, in the classroom. Some of the changes that, that have been made are progressive around bullying and, and um, the gay-straight alliances. I want to acknowledge my colleague, Laurie Blakeman, in that respect. Uh, but racism and bullying related to First Nations continue, and. It's a very complex and, and, and it requires a comprehensive approach and it may, means that it has to be a priority. It has not been a priority. Thank We're you. going to see many more announcements in the next few weeks about what the government plans to do. I guess the question really is, can you trust them to deliver on some of these fundamental commitments to our humanity, 
to our environment and to a longer term economic framework that will allow us to deliver on those things. Thank you. Do we have time for one more? Closing comments now, thank you. And we'll start with the wild robes. This upcoming election is an opportunity to finally bring out generational change in Alberta politics. We believe we will be a strong opposition that continues to hold this government accountable to deliver on their daily election promises, which includes adequately and predictably funding our basic services of education, health care, and social services. We believe that new school construction must be need-based and not politically motivated. The Wild Rose Party desires a shift in our relationship with teachers and the Alberta Teachers Association. Let's build that relationship on trust, consultation on direction in educational change, respect, and the Wild Rose Party supporting the Alberta Teachers Association in its current form and function. This election, we want to ensure Alberta teachers and the Alberta Teachers Association to trust the Wild Rose Party to speak on behalf of the work of our educators do and strongly advocate to fix a system the PC government have neglected, underfunded, and undervalued. Please consider a vote for Wild Rose as a vote for your voice to be heard in the legislature. We will continue to reach out to Alberta teachers to hear your concerns, listen to your ideas, and represent the changes that you, as experts, know that our system needs. Thank you. David Swan. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure to be here and to learn from you about the real issues of, of frontline classroom work and administration in our schools. Surely, if children are not the priority in our province, then we are not doing our job as government. This clearly has to be top of the list in terms of voting uh, influence, is who is going to protect and preserve the well-being of our children, both preschool and school and post-secondary. Why we are cutting these very foundations of our own success and our own well-being is beyond me. I am angry, and I'm staying with this political process because I think it's so critical that we have some leadership that challenges the PC status quo, an ideology that says what's good for business is good for everybody. I'm sorry. What's good for people is good for business and good for a sustainable planet. We stand for a stable, predictable funding base based on a fair taxation system, fair royalties, uh, a return on our uh, natural resource investment, and a long-term view of protecting those natural resources. We don't see any of that ability in the current government, and it's fundamentally important, I think, that all of you get engaged in the political process if you've disengaged. Obviously, if you're part of the union, you are already engaged, but somehow we have to fire up the troops out there families and communities to believe that change is possible because even Alberta can change. Thank you. Thank you. Darren Billis. Uh, thank you very much and uh, you know I'd like to thank all of you for, for once again uh, having me here to, uh, to talk about teaching and, and the state of our classrooms um, and your profession. And you know obviously it's, it's clear from this debate that there are many aspects of, uh, of teaching and learning that the government could be doing much better um, and there's no excuse for it. You know, again, I, I, it boils my blood when I think about oil at a record price two years ago, uh, yet again at a time when you as teachers were forced to take zeros because the government's saying we have no money um, and the first place they cut is again usually education or the public service which is, uh, which is backwards. Um, again, the government needs to address the revenue side of the coin. Um, it's, uh, it's a misappropriation of funds, whether carbon capture and storage or some of the, the funds to upper level managers in AHS that can be cut down and should be going to the front line. But uh, quite frankly, 
it was stupid for us to go to a flat tax to reduce our corporate taxes to 10% and basically handcuff ourselves. You know, Alberta still can be one of the most competitive jurisdictions when it comes to, to taxes, but the reason that we pay tax is because we expect the government to invest in services and programs that we all rely on, whether it's from the roads we drive on, to our schools, to our libraries, to our public spaces. And it drives me nuts that in this province, they tout the fact that we have the lowest taxes, yet we have more user fees than anybody else. And so let's collect fair taxes, let's invest in our education system. Um, and I want to say, as opposed to uh, my colleague here from the Wild Rose, the Alberta NDP under Rachel Notley are running for government. We are not just running for opposition, we are running to replace the PCs. And so on uh, behalf of my colleagues and Rachel Notley, I would like to thank you for your hard work. It needs to be acknowledged that, again, you are the reason our education system works. Uh, but we can do much better, and under an NDP government, you would have stable, predictable, adequate funding for your inclusive classrooms, for all of your classrooms, and uh, we would move forward uh, in such an incredible way that, uh, honestly, that's what drew me out of the classroom. And I can tell you that I miss it every day uh, but uh, Albertans deserve better, and we can do better. Thank you. I'd just like to thank all of our panelists today. Dr. David Swan, Interim Leader of the Alberta Liberal Party. Darren Billis, Education Critic and MLA for Edmonton Beverly Clareview with the uh, Alberta New Democrats. And Sharon Smith, who's running in Leduc Beaumont with the Wild Rose Party. Thank you all. And also thank you everyone for being here today and being such an attentive and uh, interested audience. Obviously there's a lot at stake. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a real pleasure. I, I've learned a lot about each of our three uh, panelists and uh, their parties as well and it's been interesting to hear this discussion and be part of it. And thank you to Jonathan Techmeyer at uh, the ATA for inviting me. We will uh, endeavor to get our broadcast times on our various Shaw TV community channels of this presentation. Uh, we'll get them out to the public through, I think we'll just, you know, look to, uh, to social media, both Shaw TV in your areas as well as hopefully the ATA and we'll uh, tweet out and Facebook all the information and uh, you'll can uh, join others to tune in and we are very pleased to bring this to, to Albertans. Thank you. <laughs>